Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm back at my podcast with special guest Christian Hintz. Christian is a professor. At, actually, Christian, why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, uh, let's see. My name is Christian Hintz, and I am an associate professor of history at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. Uh, I specialize in the history of modern Japan. I teach world history, business history, history theory. But that's you know that's what I do. You know. Uh, by day, by night, I am a master gardener. I play roller derby for St. Louis's uh, arch rival roller derby, and I'm a, a fiber artist and a textilist and a parent and a pet owner and you know all kinds of other things besides just being an academic and a gamer. And a gamer. So those things are all going to come together. But uh, you were not initially very enthusiastic about history. So tell me about your, your history story. How did you how did you come around to the glory that is studying history? Yeah, I was invited to the glory of studying history. <laughs> and it was kind of like a, a saving throw uh, thing that I could tell my mother I was going to do um, when it became clear to me that I just didn't think I was going to be able to get into a particularly good law program. After I took the LSAT, my graduating year, my undergraduate degree was in Japanese history. I'm sorry, my undergraduate degree was in the Japanese language. And then in East Asian International Studies, and I had been thinking, I didn't know anything about law, but I was thinking about, well, maybe, maybe I could be a lawyer. Um, It never occurred to me to be a professor or to seek that kind of a higher, higher education degree. But exactly the day that I was looking at my miserable LSAT scores, I was walking across the quad, I was at Ohio State, and um, a professor who had taught me Japanese history as part of my degree ran across, we ran into each other on, on the quad, on, on, on the oval. And um, he said to me, oh, have you graduated yet? And I'm like, no, I'm graduating this semester. And he goes, well, what are you going to do? I'm like, uh, I thought I was going to go to law school. And he goes, well, you should know that, you know, your writing in my in my upper division classes was better than my graduate students writing. And you thought about coming to graduate school in history? And I'm like, no, I had not thought about coming to graduate school in history. I didn't know anything about history as a technique. Um, I just knew that going to grad school in history, um, because he happened to be the grad director and he promised me he could get me as the grad director, uh, you know, um, a, a f- some funding for two years and then we could apply to get me to go overseas for a while and like he could he could figure out the finances of grad school if I was interested and uh, they wouldn't care very much about my GRE because he knew me personally and all this kind of things he could make a deal right so you know I was I was looking for something to do besides law school while, while I figured out what I wanted to do right so <laughs> this is a really un unromantic story about um a moment where I ended up studying Japanese history or studying history out of necessity or kind of a Hail Mary and then falling in love with it slowly, right? Becoming interested in it slowly, recognizing that it is actually important and powerful slowly. And also coming to some sort of conviction that actually I could teach. Like I'm I'm not sure if I'm the world's greatest researcher, but I'm actually a really good teacher. And um, that, that, was pleasurable to me learning to teach. Um, and I've been spending most of my career, this was, you know, in, in the nineties, I've spent my last 30 years teaching myself to teach. So that's, uh, that's what I do. And I think a lot of us would love to have you as a world history teacher, because if I am correct, you have made a, an entirely gamified world history course. Is that correct? That's correct. That's right. So I I call it gaming world history, the first 50,000 years where um, I uh, have applied critical theory, such as historical materialism, and uh, which, and uh, I don't know, <laughs> theories of how to study history from the Annal School, which is a French, a French the- theoretical framework, and uh, historical materialism, which is a somewhat Marxist uh, hi- uh, th- theoretical framework, and big history, which is a, another theoretical framework. So I use these th- theoretical frameworks to build a game um, that uh, explores how humans' relationship to energy has emerged over time. Um, 
So we begin with the history of the calorie, and then we move to the history of what happens when you've got surplus calories. And we talk about how politics are shaped to move calories, to move energy through systems of various sizes. And so we begin with Paleolithic period and look at political economy and how politics controls the movement of energy from in Paleolithic societies all the way through large scale um, empires. And we deal with uh, the relationship between pastoralist nomadic uh, societies and urban societies and look at technology and all kinds of other stuff. So um, yeah, that's, that's what I did. I started that work six years ago. And after multiple iterations, I mean, I'm still, I'm, you never stop tweaking your games, right? Um, I'm still uh, tweaking my games. I had to teach myself how to teach, how to teach in a gamified classroom. I had to teach myself that because there's not a lot of literature on pedagogy of gamification that's appropriate for university or is pro- appropriate for history in a university. Um, there's lots of examples, but um, how to do it well so that you get outcomes that are strong, right? That's a trick. So, you know, game designing, I thought I thought that originally, I thought that if I designed the game, people would play, play the game, take the course, play the game and learn. And then I figured out after the first iteration, like, oh, no, 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 no. The game doesn't teach anything, right? The, the game has other purposes, right? Um, the, the game is just a substrate. Then the facilitator, the teacher, there are things the teacher has to do. Um, so, uh, that takes, that took some time to figure that out. Um, but that's, I mean, I've said this, I said this at the beginning, you know, I've been teaching myself to teach ever since, you know, I started teaching, um, you know, you look at, you, you, you try something and then you look at the results and you're like, oh, well, the kids, the students had fun, but that, <laughs> that doesn't mean they learned what I think they needed to learn. And then I have to figure out, okay, how do I, how do I make sure they're learning what I think is the critical thing they need to learn? And that's changed over time. And when I got to gamification, I started out with game design, right? Game, how do I design a course? But then I didn't know how to deploy deploy the game. And so, you know, I, I, I thought about both of these aspects. And then I began to teach other people how to do it. So when you talk about a game, so there's lots, I've been talking to lots of different people about games recently. So sometimes when people say a game, they mean something that's kind of like model you in or role play. Other people right. mean, you know, you put dudes on a map and you roll dice. What kind of game or games make an appearance in your gaming history class? Okay, so there is a board game. The whole class is a game, meaning that we are in a imaginary world. Okay. Ooh, okay. um, and that has has space. It has maps, right? The game as a as a as a classroom, um, there are smaller games that model various aspects of things going on in our world, right? So if I want to model in our world the Neolithic Revolution, right? Um, there is a there is a a a board game that does that, okay? Then inside of our world, the teams, there are usually five teams. I've done it with as many as 10, but <laughs> I'm glad to only do it with five now. Um, every team is going to find some ecosystem in which to begin to farm, right? And then they're going to play a game that is a accounting, an accounting game that uh, models the emergence of vertical hierarchy. Because pa- gathering uh, gatherer hunters, you know, Paleolithic people aren't hierarchical. <clears throat> They've got a different political economy without hierarchy, right? So the question is, well, how does hierarchy emerge? What problems is hierarchy solving? And so we have a game that models that issue, okay? Yeah. So, so you know, these various issues, there are games that model them. So there's a deck building game. There's a, a board game. There's an accounting game. And then there's a, a large-scale RPG that is both accounting and RPG, right? Um, and by counting, I mean, you know, they've got calories coming in and they got to spend calories. You can think about calories as in the, in the gathering and hunting uh, features of the game, that's literally counted in calories, right? But by the time you get to large scale states, it's counted in bushels of grain and then money, right? So it, these, these are proxies for the same thing. I, I make the argument that, you know, all of these are proxies for the energy that takes to, you know, turn sun to raise a temperature, raise, you know, an ounce of water one, one degree, right? So energy is all comes from the sun and human beings are all living creatures, you know, uh, consume it, 
you know, it, t- take it in, use it, you know, and that's part of their biological processes. Okay. And so that's all a proxy for, or that's can be represented in terms of objects, you know, institutions, behaviors, all of that is a, a measures of accumulated energy. So basically you have an overarching game that then has lots of smaller games inside. inside. Of so do you have a team mm-hmm. that wins every semester or year? No. So it's um, not a zero sum game game. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, meaning that um, there are different winning conditions for different games. And so a single game can have more than one winning condition, which means you different, different people can win, different teams can win different aspects of it and get some bonuses for the next, for the next segment. Ooh. Right. So it gives them a boost for the next segment, right? Um, and then, you know, there are all kinds of achievement points for having, you know, essentially essentially beating bosses, having achieved certain kinds of really difficult to achieve um, goals. Um, and then that is uh, calculated into each uh, team's, like, team grade, right? So you can get a half, half percent boost if you are able to, you know, kill this boss, kill this, ki- kill this boss. So... Um, that is used to cushion student grades, which students at university are terribly anxious about grades, right? Oh, yes. And this kind of learning is really terrifying to them, A, because they don't, especially in history, they don't like group projects. Nobody likes group projects in history because no one expects you in history to do a group project. People might whine about it in chemistry, but they do it. <laughs> you try to get students to group projects in history and there's like rebellion and they're threatening to tar and feather you, right? So, so I'll be real. I have always hated group projects because I always end up doing all the work. It sucks. So yeah. how would you make a group project something that students want to do? Oh, I don't care. <laughs> what, what, what does that mean? What is that? Like, can you make can you make a test something they want to do? I, I don't know. Sometimes. <laughs> My students what? don't know I'm testing them half the time. Well, that's that's the trick. OK, so partly you have to make the group project something really frigging interesting. OK. Mm hmm. And then you have to make the group project big enough that nobody can sit out. Okay. Mm-hmm. Then you have to make mechanisms for the team to grade each other. Ooh, brutal, right? but important. But important. And it, it helps to make group work. And it's taken me time to learn this, right? To make group work work. I have to assign everybody in the group or I have to make roles in in each team and then have them choose among themselves who takes what what role so that there are specific responsibilities every person in the team has that they have to satisfy right Mm -hmm. and then you know you know each team has two scribes so scribes have to keep minutes who was at the meeting who wasn't what did they decide to do what didn't they do and if they don't do that that affects that individual's grade I have to have ways of um, holding them accountable to me for what they themselves are doing. Right. Right. Uh, As well as be accountable to their team members. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, they're very uncomfortable with this. And I, I, you know, it's, it's very, it's very straightforward. Teamwork gets one team grade. Okay. You cannot send me an email saying, you know, Mary did schlocky work on this. We expected her to do better, but she didn't do it into the last minute or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. In the real world, right? There's very little you can do you, you do in the real world that is not a kind of a group effort. As my, I make this a point. There's not a whole lot you can do by yourself in the world that's worth anything. Most things you do all by yourself in the dead of night aren't worth sharing and they don't make the world safer for democracy, right? So we have to work in groups. This is what we do, right? That's what humans human beings are group creatures. Okay. And if you were working in an office someplace, your project that your boss has made you do is only as strong as your weakest link. And you don't go to your boss and say, uh, don't pay, don't pay, don't pay Mary as much as you pay me because she didn't do her work, whatever. Right. The quality of the finished product is what the group did. All right. Now at the same time, I have to have um, ways to measure individual, 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 individual understanding, individual work, individual effort. So both of those components are there. Okay. And I'm not going to fool with you. Um, there's a learning curve for students on this. And quite frankly, this is more important that they learn, learn this, 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 these things that we're talking about here. That's more important that they learn that than they know about Harappan civilization 
and, you know, Mohenjo Daro or the Chin Empire, like that kind of, that kind of history is useless. All right. If they forget it, they can look it up on Wikipedia. If they're dying to know, oh, what was the first empire in China? Like that, they will be able to find that. Okay. You're breaking my Latin teacher heart here, Christian. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, but, but, but the, the thing is that you, what's happening in the classroom isn't, the content is the vehicle for something else. No, it's true. And this is where gamification is, is very important because um, we've gotten all confused and made as if somehow the, the content is the point. Or is it content is the only point, right? Yes. I yeah. love history. I find um, explanations for the present in the past all the time, right? Um, it's about identity generation, identity formation. And, you know, I want my students to learn to make stories, not just to receive stories that I know, right? Historians don't just receive stories. It's not like a pot, pot of knowing, right, what happened in the past. Uh, history is something that you make. You, you People make it. They write it, right? They have a technique for telling a story, for building stories. History in the 20th century, how it's written, is a particular 20th and 21st century. It's got certain rules about how you make it. That, that's all. I want my students to be enabled to make stories. And it sounds, it sounds bizarre, but if your boss says to you, we had a budget shortfall, why? That's a historical question. That's the truth. And I need my students to be able to hear a historical question and then go look in some records and figure out why there was a budget shortfall. Yeah, and tell a very compelling story about it, because, uh-oh. Because you, you have to explain it and make sure that nobody, you're not the one who gets in trouble, whatever. You, you see what I'm saying? Absolutely. So this is a practical matter that includes things like resiliency. Like, what do you do when you have to solve a problem that the boss tells you to solve and you don't know the answer? Can you make a hypothesis and so show how you got it? That's what you have to do. That's the same thing as doing history. That's the same thing as making a story. This is the story as best I understand it with the data I have, right? So making students comfortable with telling a story that might be broken, that's my job. That's what happens when I get published, right? So if people want to study history, they have to know what a historian does. I make broken stories. I improve other broken stories or I alter or add a different voice to another unfinished story. Other people think my story is wrong or stinks, isn't compelling. And I have to put up with that. Or they take my story and they go tell it and tell it wrong. I have to put up with that. This is what historians do. This is what anybody who's solving a complex problem is doing. So how do you balance between the educational aspects of your in-class games and the fun element? I mean, I'm sure that people take a class called Gamifying History because it sounds fun. Um, and I'm sure that the, yeah. the course delivers on some level, but where's the balance there? Yeah, I don't know how to... That's a good question. I don't know because I'm frequently like snapping my fingers in front of my students' faces and saying, wake up, we're not playing wake up. <laughs> We're working. Right. Yeah. And so I have to, and I actually call these, you know, mindful disruptions because otherwise they'll end up, I mean, and the, now that, now that the, that, now that people who are interested in, in this course know that it's here at the university, at first students didn't know that it was a gamified course and they'd stumble in and be shocked. Right. But now these, now people who are interested in gaming want to take the class. Right. And that means that what they end up doing is like looking at the, the data, right, that shape the mechanics, like how many, how, you know, how many, you know, does this, do these things stack? Does this, you know, you know what I'm saying? What, what feature will counter this other problem over here? And they actually like, think about it like big data, right? Mm -hmm. And they think, how do I break the mechanic? Like this, so this gamers are thinking about it differently than history, historians. I, I want them to think historically, not gamely whatever word you use right? right so they'll try to break so, your system but that's not necessarily the goal well and here's the thing is that if they try to break my system they're critically thinking i don't care that's okay right mm -hmm. and you know part of being uh you know a gm uh is is knowing how to roll with the unexpected how how to be nimble with with 
it, this is part of the issue with gamification. It, well, I don't know if it's just gamification, but it's certainly um, marked strongly in gamification <clears throat> is that I'm, I'm opening up the potential that my students will understand a principle and still get the details wrong. Or they'll misunderstand a principle and have consequences. Right? Right. So, um, and I have to let them be wrong. Otherwise, they can't, the game won't work. So if they if they do things that try to break the mechanic and they make decisions that don't advance, um, that don't advance, uh, that don't advance my goals. Ah. <laughs> right? Right? Um, it's still, it's still my job to make them reflect on and interpret what their choices inside the game caused Mm -hmm. and why the game responded to them the way it did. Right. So it's the interpretive moment that's important. So basically the games that they play are generating like a data set or an experience that then they interpret and then use their interpretations of that data to draw conclusions about history, which are hopefully yep. the ones that you were looking for, or ones that would pleasantly surprise you. Well, and I'm often surprised, and uh, their insights are actually really valuable, right? So the the point is the critical thinking, not whether or not uh, they are able to, you know, explain, you know, how Paleolithic rules of reciprocity uh, express themselves, you know, in, you know, in mercantilist societies. That, that That's not the point. The point is that they exercise their brain knocking their head against it. Okay. And I mean, it's not clear to you how, 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 how the game works. So there's five, five teams. Okay. And they all begin in a different ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, as gather and hunters. And then based on how gameplay evolves, there are projects buried throughout the game, okay, where they have to make historical artifacts, okay? Um, Right now, they are, my my class right now, they're making um, coil-built pottery. They are making drop spindles and spinning yarn. They are making brined foods. And uh, they're researching uh, about uh, how different people in particular ecosystems manage surplus manage surplus material because gathering hunters don't have surplus right so they have to document all the stuff and make um they make they make um in this case they're making um children's stories they're making um musical instruments that's something else they're making they're doing performances with those things okay and all this stuff gets archived all right and you know they're going to make codes they, they make codes of law they make graffiti they make every time i I run it they make different kinds of historical artifacts okay and the whole point is that by the time they get to the end of the story they have to go into a different team's archive and explain the political economy of their region and how that changed over time so they have to do a historical analysis of this matter using these these analytical frameworks that I've provided that are built inside the game. And can they understand all of this data, right? This kind of granular data that you might find, uh, you know, and there's a lot of financial data because they have to have imperial budgets and expenditures and investments. And, you know, they've got to deal with bureaucratic corruption and, you know, trade and, you know, famines and all these kind of crazy things are going on simultaneously. So they, they're creating, while they're playing the games, the, the historical material that then they can use to write a history of somebody else's, of a different team's region, okay? So it's very, it's very tightly connected that they're producing historical material, right? Mm-hmm. And then they have tools with which to understand or to interpret historical material. Does that make sense? It does. It sounds really fun. And, you know, the thing that's so interesting about it is that, you know, when you say, oh, it's a gaming class, it's a gamified class, I think that there might be people who misinterpret that as something like, oh, it's fun, it's light, it's like history. It's like history for poets, except history is for poets, you know, like the biology for poets class. But, you know, (laughs) no, this is far more work. 
This is far more work than any class that you have to do. It is much harder. This sounds harder than any history harder. class that I took because I knew how yeah. to just read the book, go to the lectures, and figure out what I was supposed to say. That's right. My job has been to teach myself not to do that to students anymore. And it's not just in my non-gamified courses. I've got ways of doing it too. I try everything I can, I can think of to break students' reliance on that reflex because that reflex will never be reproduced in the, in the quote-unquote real world. It'll never be reproduced, right? You can't go to the cliff notes to ask how come there's a budget shortfall. That's not what the boss is asking you to do. When your kids are acting crazy and you don't know how to solve the, the problems, right? There's no book. There's no textbook. You got to look at your data and figure out what the hell to do. No one's going to tell you. So I'm weaning them of me telling them anything. I feel like college age me would have been so frustrated at the, uh, with this yes. at first. And then I would have been yes. really satisfied by the end. Is that like a pretty normal that's, student cycle? That you that's, classes? Normal. that's normal. That's normal. <laughs> That's exactly what happens. And I mean, and it's an emotional, it's an emotional labor, right? In the sense that I am intentionally putting students in a place where they don't know what to do. Right? Mm -hmm. All of the tools that they learned in junior high school and high school don't work. I mean, you can try them and I'm glad you know them. And this is something that frustrates me. So, you know, you hear a lot of professors complaining, complaining, you know, oh, and this is, as a historian, I know this. This has been true as long as there have been teachers teaching. Oh, this generation of students, right? They don't know this. They can't do that. They can't do anything. They lack whatever it is that our generation supposedly had, right? We're always whining about how unprepared they are, how underprepared they are, or how badly prepared, whatever, right? There's this long list of complaints about students. Yes, they go all the way back. <laughs> My students are really good at what high school prepared them to do. They're really good at it. Like, I can't do this, right? This kind of memorize things and then fill in the blank, you know, find the word that's in the textbook that fits in the blank, like this kind of thing. Like, they're really good at it, right? But that's not useful to them. It's not useful to me. So I have to disallow it and disable it. And then when I take away the tools that they know to use, then they're left going like, uh, uh, what do I do? And gamification helps because... People know how to play. They think they know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Play is something that's familiar, right? And competition is useful. Doing something difficult in a group, that's easier. That's how come teamwork actually is important in this in this context because you gotta have you gotta have somebody who you can look at and say, I don't know, do you know? I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Nobody knows. And then you don't feel so stupid because nobody knows, right? You, you gotta you gotta have a group to support you. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that's, I'm putting them someplace, I'm putting them in a bad place. And that's the only place you can grow from. Gotta have a little pain to get that intellectual gain. So here's my other question. I'm very curious about this as well. So students, as we know, are very grade conscious and not, I think one of the reasons people end up developing students at the, the middle and high school levels who are so interested in rote knowledge, correct answers is because it's easier to yep. grade. How do you yep. assess performance in a class where you're going to be making mistakes, where you're playing a game, where you might lose, where, I mean, I know that oh. there's also a quality of analysis, but, you know, are they writing throughout the semester as well? Are they, I mean, I'm just sort of curious, just as an educator, like, how does this work? I shall, I shall send you a syllabus. I mean, they, they um, you know, they, they do micro projects constantly, 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 right? And, um, you know, they're not writing expository style things. They write a lot, but not expository stuff, right? I'm not interested in teaching them expository writing anymore. I just, I work, worked and worked, in, no way I could work it around and think, does anybody need to know how to write a five paragraph essay anymore? Right? Mm. Um, if you want to write a five paragraph essay, uh, you need to, you need to master that, you, you know, I don't know. So I teach the five paragraph essay but I teach it with a specific, if you're going to do that, you need to have an argument and each paragraph in the essay needs to be dedicated to some part of that argument. You can't just write right. five so, paragraphs and call it a day. So what they're doing is writing arguments. Okay. Meaning an answer to a question and then explaining the data that 
brought them to that hypothesis, all right? So, but you can do that in a, you can do that in writing. You can do it in a PowerPoint. You can do it in a lesson plan. There are all different kinds of ways that you can have students iterative, iteratively practice this reflex of, of looking at data and making an argument, make, looking at data, making an argument, looking at data, making an argument that isn't like, okay, write a paper now. So, you know, we're not in a paper writing class, right? We're in a production class, make things, okay? And um, at various points in different voices, using different rhetorical techniques, right? Explain, here's an example, okay? Um, there's a part of the game, for example, uh, where the, the emperor, empress, whatever, um, has a, mm, you know, a council, you know, the minister of this, the minister of that, the minister of the other thing. And I have, um, and this is after having built in a lot of other, other issues, right? One of the projects is that they have to come up with two different infrastructure programs, to submit in a memorial to the emperor, all right? So uh, a minister from one, uh, you know, the, the, I don't know, the, the minister from one ministry is going to say, we need to build for, for our empire function, this, 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 in this order for these reasons, all right? And then you have to have his competitor say, no, no, what we really need to do is invest our money at the beginning of the empire in this, 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 this kind of program. And these two programs have to manage what's something that we call the efficiency axiom, all right? That's a concept that's in, introduced at the very beginning of the course. And every iteration, every, every, as you move through the course, the meaning of the efficiency axiom and how it operates becomes more complicated, all right? So they're going to deploy uh, like a 20-year a infrastructure building program. Here are these two plans, all right? And then... They have to, in the memorial to the emperor, say how come the other person's plan is wrong and how come their, their plan is right. Mm. right. And this is all this is all data that becomes part of their archive. This is, you know, an imperial conversation, right? Then the emperor has to write his decision, her decision, explaining how come they're taking which, uh, which part of each project, of, of each proposal. They could take either proposal whole or they could you know, patch it together and, and make an imperial proposal and, you know, chastise the dude who wrote a lousy proposal and praise the dude who wrote a good proposal. <laughs> all right. Now, all of this, all of this is text that exists in the archive that then later another, another team is going to look at. And when they say, how come this empire collapsed? How come this empire couldn't have enough res revenue to raise an army big enough to fight off the Mongols? They can look and see. Well, this is how they chose to spend their their scarce resources on an infrastructure project that was heavy on bureaucracy, you know, low on standardization. I don't know, right? Whatever it is. Okay. So this is this is that this is that issue of making arguments based on evidence, right? Um, and then they play it and see if it works. That's the thing, right? They make this plan and then they have to roll it out and then they'll see if it works. This sounds so cool. I would totally take this class. But on a personal note, um, uh -huh. what do you play for fun? What do I play for fun? Yeah, you're a gamer. What are you, what are you playing right now? You know, right now I'm not playing a whole lot of anything. Um, I, play, I play a lot of World of Warcraft, which I, I feel like I'm embarrassed. It's embarrassing to say that. No shame. Right? Um, I play, uh, gosh, I'm interested in the, the non, the non-competitive games right now. I mean, I've got kids who are sensitive and don't like losing, right? So we work on cooperative games more. Um, so like, uh, we'll play Mice and Mystics, you know, we'll play, oh, I don't know. Oh, I know what we're enjoying right now is Wingspan, right? So that's about it in terms of board games um i spend an awful lot of time playing roller derby right <laughs> so uh that's physically extremely challenging and exhausting so i don't have a whole lot of leftover juice after that you know i'm not i i was a gamer most actively from high school until i 
finish my PhD. And then by then I had a two-year-old and the learning curve that you need to make to become a professor, you know, um, w- when you get out into the work world. And you, I moved far away from, you know, where my gaming community was and didn't have time to build a new one. So, you know, as someone who gamed intensively and regularly as a young person, uh, now that I'm in my mid fifties, you know, it's just what we do with the family. And then me turning what I know about games and gaming into my teaching. That's still so awesome though. And I'm totally jealous of the roller derby skills. That is fantastic. So oh my gosh, so if, <laughs> if my listeners want to find you, where can we, where can we find you on the internet? Well, you could find uh, my Gaming World History uh, uh, webpage, which is at um, gamingworldhistory.com, one, one frame, one, one phrase. Uh, you can reach me through the university. Um, so my email address would be chinz at siue dot edu. And, you know, if you look me up on Facebook, you're liable to find, find me. So that's mostly how you get me. Awesome. And as everybody who listens to this knows, you can find me anywhere on the internet as Beyond Solitaire. Feel free to reach out anytime. Christian, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was so cool to hear about a world history class that is this challenging and just exciting. Well, you know, I just really appreciate that anybody's interested. (laughs) It's, you know, you kind of work on your own, you know, in your lonely and you're lonely Garrett with your ideas. And then to find out that somebody thinks what you're doing might be worthy besides you. That's really, that's really affirming to hear. And I really appreciate your interest. Thank you so much. And listeners, thank y'all so much. Happy gaming.